Hello and welcome to the Tank Museum here in Dorset. My name is Richard Cutland and I'm part of the team that works on the massive multiplayer online game World of Tanks. And for 30 years before that, I served in the Royal Tank Regiment as part of the British Army. For this bottom five, I'm going to look at one particular vehicle and concentrate on five things that drove us insane. And that vehicle is this, the FE4201 Chieftain Main Battle Tank. This video has been made possible by our supporters on Patreon, our YouTube members, and our super thanks donors. Please join them if you can, and support the Tank Museum. And thanks for watching. Kicking us off at number five, it's not even the vehicle itself. It's the CES, or the Complete Equipment Schedule. The stuff that was actually issued with the tank. It was absolutely mind-boggling. And above me at the moment is just a tiny proportion of the amount of equipment that was meant to be carried on board the Chieftain. Now firstly, of course, as a new crewman, you had to learn where everything was kept. This was critically important, so everybody knew where one particular item was. And of course, if there was any crew rotation, the new crewman would know where it was as well. There was items for everything. Items to clean the main armament, items to service the track. There were items for absolutely everything you could possibly imagine on the tank. There was all of the track bashing equipment. There was the stuff for cleaning the machine guns. There was also a radio CES issued absolutely separately to everything else as well. It was absolutely incredible. And of course, some of that equipment you quickly learned wasn't actually needed, certainly when you were on exercise. And the worst thing about all of this as a crewman, well, you had to account for everything. So woe betide you if you ever lost an item of equipment. And at number four, believe it or not, is the hatches. Now, I know this may appear like a pretty minor thing, but the hatches were awful on Chieftain. They were heavy, as you can see from the commander's hatch, and they also didn't work particularly well. Now, what I mean by this is, of course, that obviously if we were in an NBC environment, so nuclear, biological and chemical warfare, we'd have to close down A pretty rapidly, and also the seal would have to be really good. Now, the seals just didn't work on Chieftain. We were forever changing them, they were forever falling off, they were really bad. Now this is the commander's hatch, we've got the loader's hatch, we've also got the driver's hatch. And when I was a driver, the driver's hatch was absolutely impossible to close from the inside. I would literally have to be a contortionist, be upside down in my seat, put my legs against the roof and pull with all my might. And even then, we'd probably have to get another member from the crew to jump down, stand on top of the hatch so I could close it. So it was something which was pretty minor, but drove us mad. And at number three, it's servicing and general maintenance. Now, there's no doubt at all that the maintenance of the Chieftain was a never-ending task. On exercise alone, there were so many checks that had to be carried out at every opportunity. There were first parades, halt parades and last parades, where the poor old driver would be checking oil levels, checking for leaks, checking for any problems, checking the track for any damage and also the tension. The tank park regime was never ending and there always seemed to be something that was either broken and needed fixing or some servicing that needed doing. Put it this way, as a chieftain crewman, you were never bored. At number two is crew comfort or lack of it. Now, of course, ergonomics don't feature highly in any tank designer's list of wants or wishes and chieftain was no exception. We're here now inside the fighting compartment of the Chieftain. So in here we'd find the commander, the gunner and the loader. Now by far the comfiest position was that of the commander. Nice seat that he could adjust on there and it was a pretty comfortable position. By far the worst was the chap who sat in front of him, the gunner. And that was my first job in the Chieftain. It was an awful position to actually be there for any amount of time. The commander would constantly be kicking you in the back and after a couple of hours sat in there, your legs would actually become numb. And like all things in the turret, safety was a priority, so you'd have to be very careful where you put yourself. The poor old gunner was squeezed into the corner with when you're going cross country, the breach bouncing up and down, so you'd have to be very careful where you put your arms or legs. By far the most amount of room was that where I'm stood at the moment of the loader. Now this is easy to say, he did have a bit of room in here, but you had to remain standing on this turntable, which I'm on at the moment, because everything else would be rotating around you. And again, likewise, like the gunner, he'd have to be very careful where he puts his arms and legs. 
There was actually a seat that was issued for the loader and it would just go fixed onto the tire ring here. But the seat was atrocious and it would collapse at times. And of course, the last thing you want as the loader is the seat collapsing and you falling into the travers. So most of the time when you weren't either loading the main armament, working on the radios or making a cup of the rest of the crew, you would get yourself in a comfy position somewhere safely as the tank was bouncing across country. In terms of comfort, it was the driver who had the best seat in the house. It was extremely comfortable, and when I was a driver, you could actually get a really good night's sleep on that really comfy seat down at the front. Another important consideration inside the turret was that of the temperature. Now, as you can imagine, most tanks of this era didn't have any heating or cooling systems. The only thing we had to keep us cool in the summer were the fans, which didn't work particularly well. But by far the worst time was the winter. When you're on exercise in Germany, the snow falling outside, it was absolutely freezing inside the turret. Now we were issued, and for a very brief period, these like little space heaters. However, again, like a lot of things to do with Chieftain, they didn't work particularly well, and they just kept blowing fuses. So there you go, that really rounds it up for crew comfort. Not particularly great, but you know what? We got used to it. And I'm sure it comes as no surprise to anybody that at number one, it's this, the Leyland L60 multi-fuel engine. And this desire by the British designers to have a multi-fuel engine certainly didn't do the tank any favours whatsoever. It was woefully underpowered and vibration was excessive. But above all, it was the reliability. It was, to start with anyway, pretty atrocious. There were constant oil leaks, and very rarely would you find a chieftain parked up anywhere without a drip tray underneath gathering up the oil that was leaking from the main engine. Fan belts would be constantly stripped, and the driver really had his hands full on the maintenance side on exercise to keep everything ticking over. Certainly you'd see all drivers always covered in oil with their head in the back decks. There is no doubt at all that this was the biggest issue with the chieftain. And that, of course, is why it's my number one. So there you go. We love the Chieftain. Yes, it drove us mad at times, but it always, always, always will remain in my heart as a very special tank. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to subscribe, and if you can, please support the museum on Patreon.